Um, hi, I'm Lisa Musselli with Autism Response Team, and I've been in the field going on 17 years now, and I'm a board certified behavior analyst. And today we're going to talk about a make and take behavior plan. So I'm going to try and go through it really slowly where you're thinking about a behavior that would really apply at home so that you can create your own behavior plan. Um, we hear parents say all the time that ABA is magic or it's just this thing that happens and it's not. It's something you can easily implement um, as a parent at home. So I want to be able to give you some resources and tools to be able to do that. So ABA is a science and it's a scientific approach to studying behavior and it involves a very systematic method to seeking this knowledge. So we'll kind of go over how you can systematically watch your child's behavior and watch what's happening around that behavior to determine how to proceed. ABA does not just apply to autism, but that's mostly the questions that we get. So just keep in mind, if you do have a child with autism, that they're struggling with social interaction, communication, and repetitive patterns of behavior, or what we call rigidity. So I really like things done in this order, in this way, and if it doesn't happen like this, then it's not okay. So these are kind of the three components of autism that you want to be aware of and mindful of when you're planning your child's behavior plan. So first on the handout, the first thing is the behavior. So I want you to take a minute and just think about what does the behavior of your child look like? Um, it could be hitting, kicking, screaming. Um, I want you to really put, keep in your mind what the behavior is that we want to focus on. I know you may have 10, 20 behaviors, but what's the main behavior that you're seeing that's really impacting your child and impacting your family right now? And I want to give you a minute to write that down. And then how intense is it? Does it progress sometimes from your child yelling no into them throwing items? What does that general behavior look like? And really keep in mind the intensity and then how long it lasts. And if it is a behavior that escalates, try and write down what that escalation looks like because that is relevant to really start observing as a parent how that escalation occurs. So with some of our kids, it may start with them tensing their bodies. And to me, that's an immediate sign that what's probably gonna happen next might be the yelling. And then if the child doesn't get what they want, they might escalate to throwing an item, hitting, kicking, um, whatever that may be. But that escalation is important to kind of start watching very closely. So next we're going to go into the ABCs. The antecedent is what happens before the behavior. It's also called a discriminative stimulus, so I'm not trying to get too sciencey, but a stimulus is just a thing. It's anything in the environment. So a discriminative stimulus is that thing that actually sets off the behavior or um, that we discriminate to set that off. So antecedents are really thinking about what happens before the behavior. Maybe it's when I'm on the phone and I'm not giving the child attention. Maybe it's when I give the child a non-preferred demand. Maybe when it's bedtime. Uh, maybe when it's the child feels out of control. So whatever those things may be, that's typically um, your antecedent. And try and think of those examples, and then we'll go into that more on your worksheet. The behavior is their response to that antecedent or that discriminative stimulus. And we want it to be observable and measurable. So if you think about, oh, my child just has a tantrum, it's hard to really see that that behavior is improving or getting better. So you want to be as detailed with yourself as a parent as possible. Um, and it's OK if you can't do that now. Um, in the middle of the behavior, it's overwhelming and you're not identifying a whole lot. So sometimes taking the time that evening or on the weekend 
maybe going and taking a nice bath if you're able to take that time away in the evenings once your kids are in bed um, and just thinking back through what occurred and what that looked like and then the consequence is what happens after and that's either going to increase or decrease the future likelihood of the behavior and we'll kind of go into those as well and the more this is your plan no one's going to see it no one's saying you're doing this wrong or right or anything like that so just be really honest with yourself about what you're doing um, and this does not make you a quote-unquote bad parent you are an amazing parent especially by going through this and trying um, and I um, have an eight-year-old stepson and I'm constantly messing up I'm like what what should I okay I should have done this instead and this is what I do for a living so bringing it into your personal home is hard and so just taking the time to think about things and thinking it through and you are not going to do this perfectly even if you have your plan and you're like great this is what I'm doing I'm going to try it it's okay to not do it perfectly because that's it's real life and it's not just some clinic where you're doing a scientific experiment that's going to go perfectly so on your paper you have the A the B and the C and I want you taking the next couple minutes and you have your behavior but I want you to think over the course of the next last week of three or three or four times where the behavior has occurred and what happened before and what happened after and no one's looking at this so be really honest with yourself about that and I'm going to give you a couple minutes to write out some examples And if you can't recall all the specifics, that's okay. Um, the whole point of this is to really start being mindful of the antecedents and the consequences. And um, after the behavior, once your child's de-escalated, I would just have a little notebook where you start writing down the A, the B, and the C. Um, this is gonna start to help you identify trends. So the first time we come up with this plan, it might not work and you might get home and you might try it for a couple days and you might say, this is awful. I feel like a failure. It's not working. You are not a failure at all. It's trial and error. And that's exactly what your ABA provider does or anyone in the school district. They're looking at trends of what's going on with that child and modifying the plan based on that. More often than not, the first plan we put in does not work sometimes the second plan we put in does not work so don't give up and the best place to start when you're feeling overwhelmed is to journal the a b and c and that's called your data so you're being scientists right now you're creating your data you're creating your trends then what you'll do is you'll look at your trends for your antecedent so what am I seeing occur the most often here before the behavior occurs? Is it um, most often it's in the evenings? Sometimes writing down the time of day helps you. Sometimes writing down the, in, the environment helps you um, on top of what's being said or has occurred. And start looking for those trends. So maybe it happens the most when your child um, just got done eating and doesn't have a whole lot to do in the evenings. 
or maybe it's happening when their siblings are in the same room and they're having to share. So start looking at that antecedent and start analyzing where are there some similarities. So this process alone may take you a week or two plus um, to feel comfortable with finding a trend amongst those antecedents. Then look at the consequences and look for trends there. So what's happening more often than not? Okay, well, when my child has this behavior, I end up going and comforting them and hugging them. And maybe I'm noticing that I do that almost every time. And maybe I need to change, maybe I need to try some other tactics because the behavior is still continuing. Through the behavior continuing, it means that the consequence is still reinforcing that behavior. So we're gonna wanna look at ways we can change our consequence. And then the behavior, that's where I would write how long it lasts, how far it escalated, because maybe there was a time where your child just yelled and then you were able to calm it down then you could study, oh wow, this was a shorter behavior. Like what happened differently here versus the longer ones? What happened differently here? So you're able to kind of start analyzing that. So through your A, B, and C, again, it's just meant to be a stress-free journal for you. And I have some parents that are like, Lisa, it is impossible for me in the evenings to get some alone time where I wanna write. Like I just got done with a very stressful day. Even when I get my child to bed, they're not really in bed. Um, and so even if it's not in the evenings, even if it's just once a week, finding some kind of time where you can briefly journal the A, B, and C, it doesn't have to be super detailed, but the more you do that, the more it's going to help you start to identify trends in what's going on with your child. The four functions are kind of what we jump into next. And this is overall, overall you can think of it as there's potentially four reasons why your child's behavior is occurring. And I know that sounds simple, but the more we can lump it into one of these four, the more it's gonna help you identify how to handle it. Okay, so the four basic functions, the first one is attention seeking. There's a child in a classroom that I work with a lot and he just had a new baby sibling at home. So he's not getting a whole lot of attention at home. And so when I went in to assess him and I was sitting in the corner, anytime an adult was with him, he was good. He was on point. It didn't matter what the task was. He was attending and he was fine. Um, but the second that adult would walk away, the papers were flying in the air. He was trying to climb on the different bookshelves whatever it took to get that attention. And even if it was negative attention, so even if it was the teacher saying, stop, don't do that, to him, it was still attention. So the antecedents were always, either the teacher looked a different direction or someone came up to the teacher and they had to have a conversation. Something where the child lost that attention, even if it was for a split couple of seconds. The consequence was always that he got attention because when you're climbing on bookshelves, you can't just necessarily ignore that. So to some degree, he was always getting attention for those behaviors. So that's kind of a classic example. Another time we see this a lot is with our kids. Um, sometimes when mom's on the phone and they'll keep asking and then they might escalate to other things um, to try and get your attention. And even if you're like, shh, stop, or do anything like that that all is still attention so for a lot of our kids it doesn't matter if it's negative attention it's still attention um, and so looking at those consequences and antecedents and if you're finding something in your antecedents and your consequences when you're analyzing the behavior that shows that they don't have an adult attention here and in the consequence they do have adult attention or peer attention then most likely the functions for attention. And so that might be the first behavior plan that we try and build and try. The next one is task avoidance or escape. So either I'm trying to avoid starting a non-preferred task 
or I'm trying to escape a task that I'm already in that I don't like. Um, and so what this might look like is getting ready for bedtime, brushing teeth, doing homework, helping clean up, any of those things. So on your antecedents, you're going to see asking them to do something or them being in the middle of something they don't like. In your consequence side, you know, see the consequence. In your consequence side, you're going to see them typically, not always, getting out of the task, getting your help in the task, things like that. So if it's task avoidance or escape, either they're having to do less of the task, they're getting your help, something like that. So look for a trend in those consequences and those antecedents if you're thinking it's task avoidance and escape. For access to tangibles or activities, this can also be access to control. Um, and this is kind of how I look at it as a behavior analyst and um, I published my research specifically on control as a function because we see that a lot, access to control. So I will address that as well because I'm sure there's some parents out there that do have questions specifically on a child that is doing things just to get control. So access to items, the antecedent is going to look like either an item was removed, they were told no they couldn't have it, kind of like that classic example in the grocery store um, that I'm like, no, don't give the child the candy because they're in line and they're waiting and the child says they want candy, the parent says no, and then the child starts screaming and crying, um, parent gets embarrassed by people that are looking on and then they get the candy. Um, and just that immediate action which definitely I am guilty of. Um, I think we all are, you just wanna get out of the store. Um, teaches that child that that screaming and crying gets the candy. So if you're thinking about access, the antecedent column is gonna be all either times where they don't have an item and they're asking for it, or they've had an item taken away by like sibling or parent, whatever it may be. And then the consequences will typically be they get that item to some degree or they're getting an alternative to that item. Another classic example that I see a lot in homes is like the video games. And so sibling will be playing video games. Their other sibling will take the game and then our client will hit sibling and then typically get the game back a little bit, but then parents come in and they both get in trouble for arguing and fighting. But that sibling got the game back, sometimes typically for a little bit, and even that little bit can be reinforcing. So even if you as parent are like, hey, I'm taking away the game, look at still what happens around that behavior, because sometimes the reinforcement and the consequence isn't always coming from you. Sometimes it's coming from that sibling dynamic, um, and that's why that aggression sometimes continues between siblings. So again, the access to control, I get that question a lot. And antecedents are gonna be them feeling out of control. So I wanna do my math before my reading. And then you say, no, we're gonna do math first, then reading. And then they might start to escalate, elope, run away from the environment, yell, whatever it may be. And then the consequence might be that they get some level of control. What's hard about this is that by me running away, I'm taking the control back as a kid. So we will talk about some strategies for that. And then if you have further questions specifically on control, my email's at the end and I'm happy to share with you more information on that because I know that's a big question for parents. Um, the last one is self-stimulatory behavior. And that is the repetitive behaviors of me constantly moving a toy in front of my eyes, or me wanting to spin in circles. This can also go under rigid patterns of behavior of me always having to do the same thing in the same order. Or everything in the house has to look the same way. Um, or I've had another kid I worked with, and I don't know how he remembered where every toy was positioned in his room, but he did, like the exact <laughs> position of every toy. So we would just work on changing the positions of the toys, and that alone was a full tantrum. 
So with self-stimulatory behaviors, the antecedent is not always so obvious, and it's typically because there isn't an antecedent. It's within themselves, and that's what makes these behaviors so hard, because if I'm doing this, there's nothing socially mediated about it, or you as mom, or you as dad, or sibling, don't have to do anything to start that behavior. That child is able to do it in themselves. And it's typically occurring because they're understimulated or they're overstimulated. Um, and so looking at kind of those aspects, and is it happening more when they're overwhelmed? Or is it happening more when your child doesn't have a whole lot of structured things to do? Um, and so looking at that, and that's kind of how I start to look at the antecedent piece of this. And then the consequence can be if they're able to continue doing it, maybe you give them something else to do, things like that. And we'll get into each one of these functions in more detail. So um, here's some examples. Um, a child is getting excited playing with a light up toy that is flashing bright. The behavior is that they begin flapping their hands and moaning. The consequence is the dad hears the moaning and puts the child to bed. So out of the four functions, as you can see, the antecedent is he's kind of by himself, um, playing with a toy that might overstimulate him. The behavior is that he starts flapping his hands and moaning, and then the consequence is that dad um, comes and puts him to bed. The function here is most likely self-stimulatory because he didn't want to lose the toy, so that's definitely not why he engaged in the behavior. He already had access to a toy that he wanted and there were no demands being placed on him. So more than likely, this is a self-stimulatory behavior because the lights are very stimulating to this child. In the second example, the child is put to bed the behavior is he gets out of bed and plays with his toys. The consequence is he gets 15 minutes of playtime before dad realizes that he's out of bed and then dad puts him back into bed. So the function is more than likely access because the antecedent is that he did not have that access to that toy anymore. The behavior is that he plays with his toys, and then the consequence is that he gets 15 minutes of playtime before dad realizes it. So now this child has learned, cool, I can get out of bed and just get some a little bit of additional playtime, which I'm sure several of our children do all the time. Um, or it becomes the never-ending list of excuses of I need water, I need a sandwich, whatever it may be when you're trying to get your child to bed. But in the third example, dad puts him back into bed. The behavior is the child now yells for dad. The consequence is dad comes in the room and reads him a story. And after the story, dad reminds him that it's past his bedtime and he'll be tired if he doesn't go to bed. So this one is most likely for attention because if we look at the antecedent, he did not have attention. The behavior is he yells, and then the consequence is now he got that attention from his dad. So you can kind of start to see how it's not as black and white as, oh cool, my child's just doing this for one function, let's solve this. So that is why I always tell parents, as hard as it is, do not carry around guilt of whatever the behavior is, because this is hard, it's very hard. And behaviors can serve several functions over time. And it's not as simple as, oh, I should have done this. Um, so please don't be too hard on yourselves. And I can't repeat that enough because it's complex. And then when you bring in, on top of just a neurotypical child, when you bring in a diagnosis, it makes things even more complex. The fourth one is dad explains that it's past his bedtime and that he'll be tired in the morning. The behavior is he bargains, no, I won't be tired, and then dad entertains that bargaining for 10 minutes. So basically the child got escape, and that happens all the time, um, where our kids are like, but 
I don't want to do this, but what about if we, you know, just talk. I have one kid and when every time we do a food rigidity program, he does not like trying new foods. And he doesn't really like talking to us that much, but every time it comes to the food program, he has a thousand stories to tell us about his day at school. Um, and it's his way of escaping the food program. And so we have to work with parents on when the child does try to talk about his day at school, of course we want to hear about that, but we want to hear about it after he tries taking a bite of his food um, so that he's not learning that escape tool. So now that you kind of have your ABCs and you're thinking about that, kind of start thinking about a function. And then from there, we're gonna jump into antecedent strategies. But before we do, these are four very important principles. It's DISC to remember when you're looking at reinforcement. So if your child loves the iPad, and let's say you want to start teaching your child to um, listen, um, whether it be sharing with siblings or doing their homework. And so we go, if we go with something as simple as sharing with siblings, and let's say you want to use every time the child shares with siblings for a couple of minutes, they can have their iPad. The first thing you want to consider is deprivation. The more deprived they are, the more effective it's going to be. If I have my iPad all day and I just had it in the morning and I just had it before I had to share with my sibling, then when you tell me, okay, you have to nicely share or else you're not going to get your iPad, the child is not going to care about sharing because they would have just had their iPad and they know they're going to get it again later. Um, and the example I always bring up with our team members and they make fun of me is cupcakes because I love cupcakes and I can't get enough and I'm always deprived of them because you can't have them every day. Um, so when I am doing like a strict kind of, you know, health regimen, especially like with the new year, and I'm not able to have cupcakes, and if someone said, Lisa, you run two miles and you can eat this whole <coughs> six pack of cupcakes, I would, I would not hesitate and I would eat them all very quickly and happily because I'm deprived of them. Whereas right after I eat that six pack of cupcakes, then I am full and I don't feel that good. So if someone at that point said, Lisa, go ahead and do whatever and you can have six cupcakes, I'm gonna be a lot less likely to do it after I just ate them. And it works the exact same way with reinforcement for our children. And that's called reinforcer satiation. So if I have, I've had a lot of time with the iPad today, then I'm gonna be so much more or less likely to do what you want me to do for the iPad because I'm satiated on it or I'm full on it. And so the more deprived your child is of an item, the more likely they are to listen to get it. So I'm not saying just never let them have it but strategically pick when you do. And so part of your behavior plan is selecting a consequence where they receive what they want when they engage in the appropriate behavior. And so whatever item you pick, try and reserve it just for that time frame. Because if they're getting that item all the time, your plan's not gonna be as effective. The second thing is immediacy. The more immediately following a behavior that the reinforcer comes, the more clear it'll be that what the child's being reinforced for and the more motivated they'll be. So if I have a lower functioning child and a parent says, okay, well, I want my child to do their homework every day. And if they do their homework every day this week, then on Friday, we can go get ice cream or we can go to the zoo. Well, often that's not immediate enough, especially when we're first starting a plan. So if we're wanting the child to do their homework Monday and we can't make it through one successful day of homework, then we wanna pick a reward that can come right after that homework on the same day. 
so that that child is receiving the reinforcement immediately. Whereas if we tell them, okay, great, you did amazing, now you have to still wait till Friday, then they're gonna be a lot less likely to wanna to engage in it the next day, and it's gonna be a lot harder to increase that behavior that we wanna see. The next is size. Is it worthwhile? So um, back to like iPad, if I'm using iPad as a reinforcer, I don't just wanna give it to them for 30 seconds. That's often not enough time for them to complete their game or whatever it may be, especially if I have a child that likes Minecraft and or Blockus and building different things, and I'm probably gonna give them a good 15 to 20 minute time span so that they actually have time to build whatever it may be um, that's gonna be reinforcing. So make sure that the size of whatever you provide is worthwhile, but also make sure it's not too much where they're now satiated on it. So if it's a cookie, maybe giving them one cookie or half a cookie instead of the whole bag of cookies. And then contingency, make sure that you're reinforcing that behavior and only the behavior that you meant to reinforce. So if I ask my child to clean their room and they're cleaning and yet they're throwing all the items in the baskets roughly and yelling while they're doing it, then we shouldn't be reinforcing that because we're basically teaching the child that they can yell and throw items and still get what they want. Um, so these are just four things to be mindful of when you're planning out your consequence or your reinforcer. So now we're gonna get into some antecedent strategies. So if you think about the behavior that you wrote and you think about your antecedents, what I just want you to do is pick two of these for right now. I don't want you to get overwhelmed but pick a couple that you feel may work for your child and just test it. And that's the really fun thing about your data or your ABCs is once you have some of your ABCs kind of journaled and written and then you start testing these, then you can easily be like, oh, nope, that antecedent's not gonna work. That one's not gonna work. Or maybe it did help. Um, so just pick one or two of these to start with and run those for several days and really watch what happens to your behavior so you can determine what's gonna be the best antecedent for your child. If it's a child that often wants to engage in control, offering choices is always so helpful. Um, I even do this with my husband of, okay, like I need your help this evening so you can either do the dishes or take out the trash versus I need you to take out the trash because I know he'll pick that. Um, I always give him the two options and then he always says I'm going to take out the trash. I'm like, great. Um, so giving those two choices and, and it can be something where you know what the child's going to pick. And sometimes I even do choices of time of, okay, you have to get off of your games or you have to go to bed, but you can either do it in three minutes or five minutes. You pick. Um, and sometimes our children have uh, no concept of time and they'll pick like the three minutes and I'm like, okay, great And then I set the timer and we're there and we're going But just that illusion that they have that control is gonna really really help their follow-through And it's the same way with us as adults. You don't want someone telling you what to do We all respond a lot better to someone saying hey I need your help at work today with this. When's the best time for you? versus I need you helping me at this time um, so the more you can offer choices, the better, but we ask you initially just to keep it at two choices because sometimes when you offer a child several choices or even with us, if I'm at a restaurant where the menu is like huge versus only has five things, I'm going to have a much easier time picking from the menu that's smaller versus a menu like BJ's where it's tons and tons of choices and you're like, I think I want this, but actually I want this. And that's exactly what's going to happen with our kids. So the more you can narrow down the choices, and again, we really, really recommend you just start with two, the more results you're gonna see from this antecedent strategy. So if you think this is gonna be a good one, then write that down under your antecedent strategies to um, attempt. The next one is behavior and momentum, or, um, and it kind of gets put under task interspersal, but behavior momentum is building momentum by requesting easy tasks and then maybe a hard task. So maybe 
if it's brushing teeth, I might run around the house with my child and maybe do like some frog jumps and be like, hey, let's like frog jump race to the bathroom and see who can brush our teeth the fastest. And so by the fact that they're having so much fun doing those easy things that they like to do, then when you get to the part of brushing their teeth, it makes that part easier too. It makes them more compliant. Um, I have one little girl that hated putting on her shoes, but she loved going outside and playing in the dirt with worms and she was just the coolest little girl ever because it was just so fun with her so we but she had to put on her shoes and she never wanted to do that and the family lived kind of on a big ranch where it was really dangerous for her to go out without her shoes so what we did was her with her was I tickled her and I ran around the house with her and then we looked at different pictures of worms and got really excited and then we had her put on her shoes and right when she got outside she realized that her shoes were on and she just started bawling crying because she had complied with us and <laughs> I was like yeah you just got those on so she didn't even realize that she was doing something she really did not want to do um, sensory wise because she was having so much fun um, so utilizing racing and all of that kind of stuff is really really helpful when it comes to behavior momentum so if you think that might help that would be another antecedent strategy that I would write down the next one under this, oh, sorry, which should really be its own, is um, task reduction. And task <laughs> reduction is making the task easier in order to increase follow through. So what that might be is instead of a child doing five pages of homework, um, it was on the slide. The yeah. Previous. Here. Yeah. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, this one right here should really be its own. But um, <laughs> instead of the child doing five pages of homework, we would have the child do three pages of homework. So you're making the task easier in order to increase follow through. The other thing I do is if a child doesn't want to clean, then maybe I'm like, hey, we both made the mess. So I'll pick up a toy and you pick up a toy. But task reduction is just making the task easier to increase the likelihood. And we do this all the time with RBCBAs at our agency because sometimes it's really long 20 to 30 page reports uh, can get a little overwhelming. And so we even work with them on, hey, every month we want you at least just doing the graph part. So by the time it comes to the point when the report is due, you only have to fill in X, Y, and Z things. So for any of us, making a task easier and more manageable is going to make it more doable um, and increase the likelihood of completion. And then next is providing non-contingent reinforcement. We use this a lot with our kids that display behaviors for attention. So if a kid has a behavior for attention every 10 or 15 minutes, let's say, or every time you're not paying attention, then what I do do is I give them attention more frequently than that. So maybe every five minutes I'm coming in and I'm like, hey bud, like I love how you're playing and I might play with them a little bit, before I go and jump on a call and then come back in. So you're proactively giving them that attention very frequently prior to the behavior occurring. It's called non-contingent reinforcement. We had another kid that liked to elope out of the home, out of the front door because he never got to be in the front yard because the parents were always concerned he'd run in the street. So he could always play in the backyard, but back to our disc, because he never got the front yard, that deprivation made the front yard so much more exciting for him. So anytime he could get out the front door, he was. And so what we worked with on him, and again, this was not an intervention we did right away. Um, it's not something I'm like highly promoting, but what we did do with him was non-contingent reinforcement. And so we got one of those kind of child leash things. And instead of him running out every 20 minutes, we would go outside and run around the block with the child leash. Our staff were tired, he was exhausted, and we started this in the middle of summer unintentionally, but it was very, very hot outside. And so he, by the end of the session, he was like, no more outside, like no more outside. Um, and then we faded it to every 30 minutes, then every 45 minutes, and then every 60 minutes. So we slowly decreased his amount of deprivation and decreased his elopement by providing that non-contingent reinforcement. 
Another way you can do this with a child that engages in control is give them that control ever so often. Give them things that they're in control of. So, hey, you know, I really don't know if I should put this picture frame here or put it here. What do you think? Like, what would you like to do? And your kids that want control, they're going to tell you. They're going to be like, um, hmm, I think you should put it like over there. And fine, do it. Put it over there. So any situation that you can give your child that control, do it because that non-contingent reinforcement of providing control is going to reduce those behaviors to get the control. Uh, the next one is priming or rehearsing a behavior related to the target skill. So priming can be done in a couple different ways. The one you're probably most familiar with is saying, okay, this is going to happen in five minutes, two minutes, you know, 10, nine, eight, and so priming can be that countdown. But another way we prime is we practice the skill ahead of time. Um, and we've done this a lot with like social skills. So if a kid has a really hard time being in a social environment because they don't know what to say to friends or how to say it or what to do, then we practice that skill ahead of time so that when they're in that environment, they know what to say. We have one kiddo that we went to church with on Wednesday nights um, at Awanas and our therapist was there with him but ever so often she'd pull him aside and she'd say okay what can what can we say to our friends again let's practice this and then he would go in and he'd immediately say exactly what he was just taught so it was just a big deficit in him knowing what to say and remembering what to say because that environment was really anxiety provoking for him so priming can be used in a couple different ways Another way can be for homework. If you have a child that engages in escape, teaching them how, remember, if you have a hard time with this, just ask me for help. I'm right here to help you. Just ask me for help. I do get the complaint sometimes that the child may just ask for help the entire time. And that's where you can do a set number of help cards. Or you can just do three little boxes and tell the child, you get, remember, you get three chances to ask for help. Just let me know when you need that help. So if you do utilize priming them to ask you for help and you feel like your child's starting to overuse it, you can always set a limit to that as well. Ecological arrangements is being aware of the other factors in the environment and arranging for that. So if siblings do have a really hard time being in a close proximity together, seeing how you can arrange the environment, um, to separate them as much as possible. I know that that's not always feasible at all. So seeing how you can arrange it where each child has an activity that's appropriate for them, things like that. So just being aware of your environmental ar arrangements. If you do have a runner, like the one I just referenced, putting a lock at the top of your door while you're teaching these skills to avoid him getting that reinforcement when you don't want him to. So those are all antecedent strategies, and we'll go into a couple of others. Differential reinforcement is another big piece of this, and you have to put one behavior on extinction, meaning when the child yells or hits to get what they want, you make sure that they do not get what they want. And that's basically what extinction means, is whatever they are used to getting from that negative behavior, you make sure, as much as you can, that they don't get it when that behavior occurs. <laughs> and then you pick something you do want to teach them, and you make sure they only get what they want when they do the behavior that you want to teach them. <laughs> so that's where you're coming up with your replacement behavior. So maybe instead of my child yelling at me, I want him to ask me nicely. Or instead of my child hitting their sibling, I want them to share with their sibling. So you're coming up with the skill that you want to teach. Let me go to the next one. And this is something to be very mindful of as a parent. This is hard. It's very hard. Um, and that's what tools like the Lending Library are, you know, there to support you with is extinction is not always a process where your child's behavior is just going to go straight down. In fact, it almost never is. Typically, the behavior is going to go up before it goes down. 
So when you start the process of differential reinforcement, which again means that you're no longer rewarding one behavior and you're rewarding the other behavior. When you start that process and you just immediately stop rewarding that first behavior, typically that doesn't go down. Usually they're gonna test it. So if I used to hit in order to get access to candy and mom decides that now I have to ask nicely and maybe wait and accept being told no sometimes, that child's not just gonna be like, oh cool, I'm gonna wait, all right. No, they're gonna, which I've had happen with a kid last week, um, instead of him hitting, he went and he climbed over mom and tried to open up the pantry and started throwing things. Um, and that does not mean that you are not doing the right things. It's human behavior to test it. Even with us as adults, if I'm used to getting something right away and now all of a sudden I'm not getting it, like maybe I'm used to calling my husband and he picks up right when I call him every time. And then let's say one day I've called him, he hasn't picked up, it's been 10 minutes, I'm gonna probably call again and make sure he's okay. And then let's say he still hasn't picked up. I wonder what's going on. You might call again. That's an extinction burst, right? You're not just gonna give up. The behaviors don't just stop. So you're going to see those behaviors increase because what the child's doing is, like we're doing, oh, if I call again, then maybe I'll get that reinforcement or maybe I'll get that person to pick up the phone. Or if I throw instead of hit, maybe I'll get that candy. So extinction is not as simple as, hey, I'm no longer gonna reward this and it's just gonna go straight down. And that's why as a parent, you always wanna have what you're gonna do instead. So if your child was hitting to get the candy and now you want the child to ask to get the candy, then if they go to hit to get it, as a parent, you're gonna say, but all you have to do is ask me, just say, I want candy and initially you might give it right away. And then over time, you're gonna start fading out how frequently you give it. But please do not be discouraged if and when that behavior initially increases because that's been studied. Again, ABA is a science and we're gonna see that behavior get worse before we see it get better. And that is our extinction burst. Often when you get through the behavior and your child is finally asking for something appropriately, then you might see spontaneous recovery. And it's just this random phenomenon on our day where the child's like, hmm, I know I've been asking appropriately, but what if I try hitting again? Is that gonna work? Um, don't be discouraged. You could have easily been doing everything completely consistently, which is never gonna happen and that's totally okay. But spontaneous recovery is just the child trying it again out of nowhere and you just make sure you follow through with your plan. So um, this is possible antecedent interventions and we go through these a lot during our teaching. Um, and this is gonna, these can always go in your antecedent strategies. And we've gone over most of these, just making sure that you're aware of what those antecedent strategies are. We're, we, yeah, we, so we're gonna go through individually. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so gaining attention, I know this sounds simple, but just making sure that you've controlled for the fact that you've gained your child's attention appropriately so if the issue is that the child's never listening, have you made sure to do all of these things prior to placing your demand in order to make it successful? So is this example good or bad? It's five in the afternoon and Becky and her son are in the house. Becky is in the kitchen and her son is playing in his room. Becky wants Robbie to set the table, so she calls him across the room and says, is the table ready for dinner? So in that example, that would probably be a bad example because most likely he's distracted. So he's probably not gonna answer her and it's not intentional, it's that he's distracted. 
Shared control is a balance of control between the therapist or the parent and the child. And try to follow your child's lead if appropriate, like I said, giving them options for that control. What research shows is that the response is significantly improved, learning is faster, and you can use more natural activities for teaching your child. So Roger wants Kent to read him a bedtime story, a favorite nightly routine for both. Kent holds out three books and says to Roger, which story shall I read tonight? Roger points to Sesame Street. Okay, I'll read that one. Look, I see Elmo, I see Cookie Monster. So he's letting the child pick the book and he's utilizing that book to help the child kind of start naming different things. And then interspersing maintenance and acquisition tasks. And we went over this and this is leading into that behavior momentum piece we discussed where you're wanting to take things that might be easier and things that might be a little bit more difficult and kind of blending those two together to increase the likelihood of your child responding. Um, responding to multiple cues. So being aware of this with your child that some of the frustration may come from them over generalizing or being overly selective. Um, I had a kid that I worked with and we were working on him naming family members and his dad was a tall man with a beard and he was out of town for work um, pretty often during the week and so mom was at the grocery store with the child and he started going up to every man that was tall and had a beard and calling them daddy um, and mom was <laughs> very embarrassed she's like no like we're fine um, <laughs> but he was over generalizing and so being aware if your child's over generalizing things or is overly selective, maybe thinking that only your white dog is a dog. And that can go into instructions at school, a variety of things. And so if your child may not be genuinely understanding what you're saying, then keep in mind that they may be overgeneralizing or being overly selective and that's gonna lead to their frustration as well. So it's not always that I'm intentionally not listening, but it might be that I'm having a very, very hard time following what you want me to do. It's 4 p.m. and Robbie is getting ready for his swimming class. Yesterday, Becky bought a new blue swimsuit to replace the old blue swimsuit and Becky said, Robbie, go put on your new blue swimsuit. Um, so this could be good if he knows the term new, but if he doesn't, he may have gone to his room and put on the old one, and then mom's like, what are you doing? I told you to put on your new one, but he may not understand those terms. And we went over this with contingent reinforcement, but making sure it's provided as immediately as possible, and that it's dependent on the correct response. So if the child does what you want, but maybe does it while yelling, I have some teenagers that will listen, but then they're cursing the whole time they're doing it. Then as a parent, you don't want to reinforce that because you're teaching them that that behavior is okay. David is in the kitchen with his daughter, Katie, getting a snack. Katie points to a yellow candy and says, red candy. David says, good try, but it's a yellow candy. Katie points to the yellow candy and says, yellow candy. There you go, Katie, David says, and he gives her the yellow candy. So this is good contingent reinforcement because he corrects her, and then when she says the right color, then he provides her with the candy. Make sure you reinforce all attempts. So when you're decreasing that problem behavior, that child is having to learn a whole new skill of how to ask for something appropriately, how to share appropriately, and it's not gonna go perfectly the first time. But if you can tell that your child is genuinely trying, give them some level of reinforcement. So if I never share with my siblings and you want me to share for five minutes, probably not gonna happen. So maybe start with me sharing with my sibling for 10 seconds or 15 seconds and reinforce that heavily. Get excited about that. Because um, we want to reinforce all attempts so that that child feels motivated to continue trying that skill. Let me 
Um, Tony and his father are eating a snack. Tony's father has made a grilled cheese sandwich and has cut it into small pieces. He gives Tony one piece at a time and models the word sandwich. Tony has vocalized three times, ah, and was given a piece of his sandwich. The fourth time Tony's father modeled sandwich and Tony started waving his hands in front of his face and the father gave him the sandwich. So in this example, especially if a child's completely nonverbal, the saying ah is awesome. But then when a child goes back to something that's not vocal at all, we don't want to reinforce that. So once you've learned, okay, you're capable of at least doing this, then you want to continue to reinforce that level and push it up from there so that we don't accidentally start to see regression by reinforcing things that we know our child's capable of. Nancy and her son Ron are at the park on a very hot day. Ron points to a drinking fountain and says, I want water. Nancy says, that was good talking, Ron. Let's get you a drink. Nancy takes Ron to the water fountain. After they have a drink, Ron says, I want ball. Ball? Okay, let's go get the ball. So this is a great example of child-led teaching and reinforcing those attempts um, because he's definitely trying to vocalize. So make sure that we're rewarding them. And then as much as you can, provide that reinforcement that's going to have a direct relationship to the behavior. So if we're working on food programs, what more current research has shown is that if we're working on the child eating broccoli, we're going to want to reward the broccoli with food because that's going to be a direct relationship versus if I'm working on play with a child, I'm probably not going to want to try and reward them with a cookie. Sometimes we have to with our lower functioning kids, especially if that's all that's rewarding. But if there's something else rewarding and you're working on increasing appropriate play, then you want to reward it with some kind of play. So you want it to have a direct re relationship. Gary and his grandma are leaving the house to go to the park. As they reach the front door, his grandma says, door. And Gary replies with dough. Gary's grandma says, great talking, Gary, and takes him into the kitchen to give him a cookie. So that is not direct reinforcement um, at all, and that's probably very confusing to the child. In this example, when he says dough, she lets him open the door. So that's a much better example of direct reinforcement of what would happen in the natural environment and the more we can make it direct reinforcement, the more likely the child is to keep that skill long term. So the next thing here, um, I know with consequence strategies, the consequence strategies after your antecedent strategies can be looking at what you're typically doing and what you need to modify. So if it's access, and you were previously giving access, in all the examples we just went through, what you would be looking at is only giving access to them when they engage in the appropriate behavior. So under your consequence strategies, you're going to want to note what needs to be done to modify based on the function. So if all of your examples were to get escape from homework, then under consequence strategies, you would no longer allow that escape. So the consequence strategies are very simple based on the demand. What I see parents do a lot is if a child throws something to get out of homework, then the parent may put them in timeout. Well, if you put the child in timeout, what did you just do? You just gave them escape from the homework. So making sure to set those consequence strategies appropriate and we've been going through them the whole training but I wanted to make that clear with the consequences based on what you're seeing and what you've determined the function to be making sure that you're shifting that in that direction as you go through and start teaching your child the skill to ask for what they want or to ask for help to complete their homework or to share with their sibling initially you're going to be much more involved in helping teach that so you might even be sitting there with your child and their siblings 
helping that sharing happen to minimize the aggression. But over time, you're going to want to fade that out. So essentially, you helping is a process we call prompting. That's all you really need to think about prompting as is you helping. Um, so whatever you're doing to help your child get that skill is prompting. So you might be saying the word for them and having them copy you. Um, you might be holding their hands and physically having them share with their sibling. With brushing teeth, you might be holding the toothbrush for them and helping them. All of those are considered prompts. As you see them become more and more successful, you're going to fade out your prompts. And in the next slide, we do have a prompt hierarchy um, with the fading prompts. So you're going to fade out the prompts for the prompt dependency. And then can you go to the next one? Oh. So for the hierarchy, I guess I take out the hierarchy is um, the hand over hand <laughs> prompting. And then you might end up fading it to a gestural prompt where you're pointing at something. And then you might fade it to a visual prompt. So we have some kids that have like pictures of their steps of brushing teeth on the bathroom um, window. The big thing when you're teaching toothbrushing or any type of skill where you're chaining things like um, brushing your hair, cleaning a room, you want to fade out your visual or your vocal prompts. So you don't want to be saying anything because what you will see happen is the child when they're brushing their teeth they're gonna look up at you and wait for you to say okay this side now this side and they become really dependent on those vocal prompts and it makes it really hard to fade yourself out same with cleaning room they'll like look at you for you saying next toy okay keep going so with those kinds of things try to not use the vocal prompts try and use more of gesture or pointing prompts and um, after you've used physical prompts and they've mastered that. Perfect. Um, and then on the next slide is my um, email. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free um, to reach out to me. Thank you.